Welcome everybody to your 60 minute CX makeover. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to share this time with you. Uh, it is a, an executive briefing. So um, I had a list here of a few of the things that uh, hopefully you have managed to gather together. And um, I'm just going to wait a few more minutes because there's a few people that were registered that have still not arrived. I know what it's like, but unfortunately, my Swiss, um, my Swissness makes me always start on time. So I know that uh, we're renowned for it. However, I will give a few minutes to those who still need to join us to to join. So it gives you a little bit of time to grab some of the documents that I've mentioned here, whether you've done the evaluator tool, then bring along your, um, your results. Um, bring some of your information about your innovations, about your information sources that you have. Um, if you follow trends, then bring a, that or just make a note of the trends that you like to follow to keep up to date on your business, the trends that have the most impact on you. And um, mission and vision statements, you should know that by heart. If you don't, click onto your website quickly and, and write that down. So um, we're going to have some fun today. And hopefully you're going to find, well, I don't say hopefully, I know you're going to find a lot of value in this because I already ran a session a couple of weeks ago and I only planned on running one briefing. However, so many people contacted me afterwards to say that they couldn't um, turn up on the day and time. So I did offer the replay. And even then some people came back to me and said, look, we would really love to have the opportunity to ask questions live and uh, to see the makeover. So I said, okay, I'll run another session. So that's what we're doing today. So um, as I said, this is an executive briefing. So you're going to get a chance to ask questions the whole way through. So if you already have any questions about your uh, CX model that you're using today, feel free to already add them into the chat um, or you can note them down. Now, the format for this, uh, this session is that I will talk about um, a topic for maybe five to ten minutes and then we're going to go um, off screen and I'll give you the chance to uh, ask questions and I will answer them on the fly. Um, as this is an executive briefing, um, you will have the uh, chance to share information about your company, maybe even some of your issues and challenges. Um, I like to say this is like Vegas. What is shared here stays here. So please be discreet um, and don't repeat to others what you hear in the session today. So with that, um, I want to start with a quick sound check. If you could let me know if um, you can hear me and see me okay. You should have a chat. Um, I think it should be on your right, but sometimes things get mirrored. I, I get a little confused. So uh, maybe on your screen, it's on the left, but on my screen, it's on the right. And... Um, so feel free to add in your questions there. And if somebody could just let me know that you can see and hear me okay, that would be great. All is good with sound. Thank you, Frank. Welcome, Frank. I see uh, you're, you've joined us from, I think, sunny Miami, or maybe you're still in Europe. I don't know. So thank you for joining us. So let's get started um, with your makeover. So Customer centricity has become a bit of a buzzword these days, but it's not just something trendy. It's something that is vitally important and it, it, it represents a really fundamental shift in the core of how a business operates. And it means that you don't just give lip service to customer experience, which a lot of companies unfortunately do. It's about making the customer the very center 
the nucleus of your business. And it's about understanding their needs, their preferences, their expectations, and then tailoring your products and services to meet them. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to look at what needs to change to make your customers' experience more enjoyable for them. And you're going to see some useful tools and processes, as well as examples from organizations that are already enjoying significant growth thanks to adopting this new CX model and making some small but very important changes uh, using them. So I'm going to start with some stats. Uh, I will assure you I'm not going to uh, share too many stats, but I wanted to set the scene because I think it's vital to understand just how important customer centricity and customer's experience is. So the first number here, 90%, 90% of businesses across a variety of industries have already made customer experience their primary focus. And as if that wasn't enough, 80% are saying that they will today compete primarily on the quality of their customer's experience. So what does that mean for you? Well, that means if you're not already paying attention to your customer's experience and looking for ways to improve it, that in fact, you're already being left behind. So the problem is that you're being left behind, but you're also leaving money on the table because 86% of buyers are actually willing to pay more for a better customer experience. So that means that if you give them a better experience, they're going to have less problems if you raise prices. But the caveat there is that only 1% of customers today feel that vendors are actually consistently meeting their expectations. So the good news is if you are being left behind or you feel you're being left behind, that you still have time to catch up. So um, that's great news. But what's in it for you? Why would you want to improve your customer's experience? Yes, you can improve, uh, you can increase prices. However, you can also develop your business and those that have adopted this new customer-centric approach that I'm going to be sharing with you have been experiencing a 12 to 15% revenue growth, if not even higher. So it means that you can increase your prices, increase your revenues, and make your customers happy. Why wouldn't you want to do that? So wouldn't you like to experience that? I'm sure you would, but I bet that the opportunity it offers is exciting, but maybe it scares a few of you, am I right? So let's have a look at that. How are you feeling today? I, I'm going to be putting up a few questions and um, this is going to be the first one. So let me just pop it up in the chat. How are you feeling today about what CX, um, your CX, and the numbers that I've just shown you mean. Are you excited by the opportunities? Are you scared that your competitors are getting ahead of you and you need to do something, but you're not quite sure? So vote now, please. Um, hopefully it's uh, coming up on your screen. So have a look at the uh, question. How are you feeling about CX at the moment? Are you scared or are you excited? Hopefully, we've got a little bit of both. Um, okay, at the moment, those that are voting, we're still getting excited, which is great, because I am too. I'm excited because there is so much you can do to make customer experience really positive for your customers. And with the tips and plans, uh, ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you, we're going to go from, if you're scared, to excited. And if you're already excited, which 100% of you are, which is fantastic, I have to say I'm not going to be responsible for any heart palpitations you get because you're going to get super excited. So the numbers, the numbers that I just shared are the actual facts. And if you're not getting excited by the possibilities that they show, then you should be scared because others are. Now, 
Obviously, I can't cover everything that's in this new CX model. So what I've done, I've chosen three areas, and I'm going to show you how you can turn them around in your own business by using the new model that is already working for a lot of my clients. So let's check where you are today on your um on your journey so i'm now going to put up another poll and um that one was 50 100 percent so now i want to ask you where are you today in your cx journey have you not started you're thinking about it but you not don't know when you're going to start you um have started or you're thinking about starting but you're not sure how to start you've made the effort to start but you've made some changes and you're not quite sure are you doing it right or not and then maybe you've already implemented some changes but you're not really happy with the results and your clients aren't either and I I'll explain why in a little bit. So, okay, so 50-50 at the moment, you're thinking about starting, but you're not sure when you're going to start. And some of you are starting or thinking of starting, but you're not quite sure where you should start. So I'm really glad you're here because I'm going to give you all the tools you need to get going. And at the end of this session, you'll already be able to get going and make some significant changes or changes that will have significant impact on your on your business. So wherever you are on your journey, um, I was I want to talk a little bit about why I was prompted to develop this model. The thing is that the reason I developed it is because when I spoke to companies, they had a very limited view of customer experience. They saw it really as the interaction between the company and its customers. And I thought, but this, this is not true. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that you need to consider to improve your customer's experience. For example, Today's model is static, doesn't change. It's siloed. It's normally run by one individual company, um, one department within the company. And in addition, it's linear. Consumers are considered, or customers are considered to move from one process to the other along their purchase journey. When I'll show you in a moment, it's far more complex than that. And I'm sure you're already aware of that. So the new model that I came up with answers these problems. First of all, it's a dynamic model. It's not static. It's connected in so many ways and it's multidimensional. So my model is, is answering the three major problems of CX today, which is limited, as I've said. So my model um, is actually, I, I was inspired by the very foundation of the universe. In other words, the atom. We and everything around us is made up of atoms. And I saw customer experience, customer centricity as being exactly like an atom. The customers are the nucleus and the company, the brands and the processes that we use within an organization revolve around and through them. And QC2, as we call it, quantum customer centricity, works because it reflects the dynamic and ever-changing interrelationship between all four of these components. Now, when they're working in harmony, they're synchronized and amazing quantum results are achieved. But when they're not synchronized, they can vibrate out of control and then collide with devastating consequences. And that's exactly why what we are witnessing today is that so many organizations have adopted a customer first strategy, but are not happy with the results they get. So does that make sense to you? Is this new model making more sense to you than the traditional limited model of just looking at customer and company interactions. Are you excited to learn a little bit more? 
I'm sure you are because I can't wait to share it with you. But I, again, have another question for you. And I wanted to understand how come the traditional CX model is so limited? Where did that come about? Why did it happen? So I did some research and this is what I found. These are the people who are telling us what CX is all about, customer experience. And as you can see, they're not typical or representative of your customers or your business. Unfortunately, many of them, majority, vast majority are men. I've nothing against men, but a lot of purchasing in a lot of industries are made by women. So having a woman's voice, I think, is important. 75% of the major consultants and advisors in customer experience live in the U.S. Unfortunately, they count for a lot, but there are a lot of other countries in the world. I've been to 127, so I know what I'm talking about. They have, on average, only seven years' experience in the business, and 30% have no corporate experience whatsoever, which means they certainly have never been in your situation. They've never been in your shoes. They've never faced the challenges that you're facing. So how can they advise you as to what to do? They can't. Be honest. Compare that with my experience. I've worked for some of the leading multinationals and since setting up my consultancy three years ago, uh, sorry, 10 years ago now, I've actually uh, included also a number of small and medium-sized uh, companies as my clients. I still obviously uh, have a lot of major multinationals, companies such as Coca-Cola and Unilever, Hero and Carlsberg a lot of major companies, but I'm also consulting some medium-sized companies because, in fact, they tend to be more interested. The big ones quite often think they're already doing what's needed. They're not. But some of the smaller companies that are very um, keen to advance and to grow are looking for all the ways, and they seem to be closer to their customers, so they want to understand how they can get even better. I've also had a lot of academic recognition for my experience and knowledge, and I've guest lectured in universities all over the world. Um, Los Angeles, uh, Miami University, I guest lecture there regularly. Um, Delhi, Beijing, Shanghai, I've been invited to speak at universities and business schools all over the world. So I'm getting recognition from not only the corporate, but also the academic world. As I mentioned before, I've actually worked in 127 countries, so I understand the similarities and differences there are between customers. And I even wrote a book called Winning Customer Centricity to help companies be, become more customer-centric. And uh, Paul Polman, who was uh, Unilever CEO at the time, called it a must-read for today's and tomorrow's marketeers. So do you think all that adds up to a difference between the other consultants I talked about, most of whom have never even had much corporate experience, you can be sure it does. So you can be comfortable knowing that I've got the expertise and the experience to help you. So with that said, let's delve into your CX makeover. And we're going to take the three biggest challenges the limitation of traditional CX um, is, is a given. So I thought I'm going to talk about the three areas, which is how we can make the CX model more dynamic, more connected, and more multidimensional. So um, we're going to start with the problem of the current model being static and the QC2, quantum customer centricity model, better reflects the dynamic and ever-changing world that we live in today. After all, customers aren't static. <laughs> There's a picture of my two cats, and uh, I can tell you they don't stay in that position for long. They're not static even, even themselves. They're, they look and then they leap. 
So um, the world today is changing, as you all know, and it's changing faster and faster. With technological support, we can do our, our job and uh, live in an ever-changing world that's 95% uh, of C-level executives actually say custom, customers are changing so fast that their businesses can't keep up. Well, if you can't keep up with your customers, how are you going to satisfy them? You're not. So some of the things that are changing with customers today, as I said, the world has gotten faster. We want answers. We want products and services, and we want them now. We want, if we have a question about a product, we expect to be answered immediately. We don't want to wait for minutes or hours on the phone waiting for customer services to answer our call, which is why a lot of people today go onto social media when they've got a complaint, because at least that way they will get an answer normally in a few minutes rather than the hours they quite have, often have to wait on, on telephone calls. Secondly, um, as a result, I think, of COVID and people starting to look online for um, shopping and things, People today are feeling worse off. They're worried about inflation and they realize that they can shop more. Um, they can get more information about the products and services they want before they buy them. And therefore, they're always checking out if they can't find something cheaper. And as a result, customers have become smarter. They're using discounts. They're checking online. Markets are becoming unpredictable because um, customers are as up to date with the market and what they're buying as, in fact, the manufacturers are. And not only uh, do we now have a hybrid model of purchasing, in fact, 33% of us are shopping far less on in store and much more online today. But we also have a hybrid lifestyle, a hybrid way of working. We don't go into the office in most companies every day. So we have a hybrid purchase pattern, a hybrid lifestyle, and a hybrid way of working. So companies and brands have to adapt to this. And the last area that I think is important to think about is that customers have become responsible. Nobody can deny the impact of uh, climate change. And as a result, customers are becoming far more sensitive. So they become more aware and they're asking companies, how do they source their, um, their raw materials? Are they using child labor? Are they using sustainable sources? And are they environmentally and socially responsible in the way they run their business? Companies have never been so targeted as they are today. So if you manage to um, pull out your societal trends that you're following today, have a look and see, are these, are these ones that you're following? Are they trends that could impact your business? If so, add them to your list. And uh, if you don't have a list, well, maybe you need to start one because these are things that are impacting your customers today they're changing and they're changing fast. So one of the areas where um, societal trends are important to follow is in innovation. And I'm sure you're all launching both products and services. So time for another um, question. I want to ask you now about your, your innovations. So how often... Do you launch new products or services today? Is it every year, every couple of years, every four to six years or less often? So vote now and we'll have a look at all these polls at the end. Um, so I'm leaving them up for enough time for you to vote between the, um, between the different polls. So today, because um, customers are becoming more and more demanding, innovation is becoming very important. And the thing is that a lot of companies today are launching what in fact are not reno uh, innovations, but renovations. In other words, they're only small tweaks 
maybe a new perfume, a new flavor, a new packaging, rather than really innovating. And this is why customers today are becoming less and less loyal because the competition launches something new, they'll switch to the competitor. You launch something new, they come back to you. So loyalty, and I'm sure you've seen the numbers are going down and down because customers are becoming more and more demanding. Okay, so we've got one third, two thirds, but the majority of you, okay, every year or, or two are launching. So um, that's how often, now perhaps the, um, the embarrassing question, and luckily I'm not seeing your names, is what proportion of your innovations that uh, that you launch are um, succeeding. And by succeeding, I mean that they met the goals that you established when management gave approval to launch that product or new, new product or service. So not saying, oh, yes, we succeeded with this, but how many actually met your objectives. And I see at least one honest person I see, or maybe it's all of you, 100% have said uh, less than 40%. And unfortunately, um, that is true. Um, I put in these numbers, uh, oh, less than 40%, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100%, because I'm sure you've seen this number, that in fact, 95% of innovations fail on average. There are differences by industry, but let's just agree the majority of innovations fail. And therefore, if they're failing, we're doing something wrong. And I think there are many, many reasons, in fact, why innovations fail. And I just want to share a few with you and the first one is the process that is used to develop new product and service launches. It's linear. Basically, um, we start with an idea and then we turn it into a concept. We'll launch it and then we'll measure how successful we've been. Now, this process, as I said, is linear. Sometimes it's a funnel. We start with lots of ideas and we end up with just one. The problem with that is that all those ideas we had at the beginning could all be great or they could all be awful. But in most companies, we have these ideas and we end up with one. So we end up launching one out of many good ideas or one that doesn't deserve to be launched at all. Another reason is that in a lot of cases, that ideation process is done internally. Uh, if you're in a manufacturing industry, quite often it's R&D and sometimes marketing that come up with new product ideas because they've got a new technique, a new technical know-how. And unfortunately, when you start with an internal idea, in a lot of cases, it's not what the customer wants. Unless you involve the customer right from the beginning all the way along that process, you are unlikely to end up with a success. So another reason, not enough involvement with the customer. And as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of cases, we end up launching renovations, which are just packaging size, uh, perfume, taste, little tweaks to what we're currently offering instead of understanding what the customer needs, what they dream of having, because quite often they don't know what they want, but they can tell you what's, what's wrong with what they've currently got. And it's quite often by listening to their complaints that in fact, you come up with a new innovation. And I always say complaints are a gift for this reason, because most Unfortunately, most customers won't tell you when they have a problem with your product or service. They just go elsewhere. There's so much choice today. Why do they stay with an inferior product or service? So every person that complains to you, 
you have to know there's 20, 25 people that have the same problem but aren't contacting you. So complaints are a gift and they can be a great source of innovation. So those of you that completed the evaluator assessment, if you did, have a look at your results because if brands were your development opportunity, then upgrading your innovation process could have a huge impact and it probably will. So I'm just going to show you an improved way of innovating and then I'm going to stop to take some questions. So um, think about those, add them into the chat and um, we will take your questions in a moment. So you can already start answering them now. So this is the QC2 innovation process. It's a virtuous circle that starts and ends with the customer in insight development. And I'll talk more about insight development in a moment. So do you see that having a virtuous circle that starts and ends with the customer and one important step that I rarely see when people launch products, that last step on the QC2 innovation process is portfolio optimization. Because more and more shelf space is becoming a problem in supermarkets. And quite often, uh, retail outlets will say, if you want something new in, you have to take something out. So every time you launch a product, look at your portfolio and look at optimizing perhaps the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule where you discard the lowest 10% unless they're really niche market. Uh, that would be an opportunity to optimize your portfolio before you go into another round of innovation. So do you see that by improving your own innovation process, you're more likely to be in that 5% of innovations that succeed than in that 95% of innovations that fail. I think you can agree that this virtuous circle that begins and ends with the customer is more likely to come up with something that the customer would like and would buy than starting from your internal knowledge, technical skills, and ideas that you have. So, before we go into the first stop, I just want to share a, a story with you. Uh, it's a client who wanted to, they were in the cola business, uh, one of the leading cola manufacturers, and they wanted to get into a healthier soft drink. So we worked together at how they would position this new drink because they weren't known for healthy products because they were getting a lot of complaints about the cola industry that they were in. And um, customers were very keen on having a healthier soft drink. And a lot of the juice flavored carbonated soft drinks were available on the market, but they wanted to go even further. And by using a tool another tool that we have in QC2 that we use for innovation called the Zoom tool, we were able to identify a new opportunity and positioning based on customers' feedback. And in fact, what we did is we increased the proportion of fruit juice in the drink because most fruit-flavored soft drinks on the market were exactly that. They were fruit-flavored. But what we came out with was a highly um, concentrated proportion of fruit juice within the soft drink. And in fact, the customers, the consumers that we spoke to came out with the positioning because they said, this is exactly what we want. It's a healthier soft drink. And in addition, they said, we would use this instead of energy drinks because energy drinks give us energy, but we know they're also not very healthy. Whereas having a drink that has a high proportion of fruit juice in it, that would give it the sugar for energy, it would give us the vitamins and minerals, and it would be a far healthier energy drink than what's available on the market. With that positioning, they launched and it was a huge success. So look out for it. 
it's a um it's amazing product really great tasting so um can you see how upgrading your innovation process with the tools that i've talked about the virtuous circle process and using i haven't explained the zoom tool but i've talked about how by starting with the customer and customer needs you're more likely to come out with a successful new launch so what would be what would a more successful innovation process look for you in your business how would you feel if you we're in that 5% of innovations that succeed, not the 95% of innovations that fail. Worth thinking about. So let's take a break now. And I'm just going to go to the chat now. Oh, let me check the poll. So we had a um, proportion of launches that um, succeed. Well, We've got uh, a third at uh, 60 to 80%, which is fantastic. And then two thirds of you that say less than 40%. So yes, it's tough. Innovation is tough. But hopefully you can understand that by using the QC2 model, you can get a much more um, successful process in place. So do we have any questions about innovation? Um, we don't seem to have any in the in the chat at the moment. I will be answering more questions at the end. So feel free if you think of anything, add them in, please do. And we will add them at the end. So if we don't have any, let's get back to the um, presentation. And the second area that I want to talk about which is that this model is more connected than the CX model that you are probably currently using. So instead of being siloed, this new CX model is connected. It connects people, it connects information, it connects employees, and it connects departments. Because I've already mentioned it, but um, the CX model, customer experience, in a lot of companies is seen as linear. We go from awareness to purchase and post-purchase. But we all know this isn't how customers experience the purchase process. This is what it looks like in most cases. And unfortunately, what happens is that along this purchase journey, the customer has connection with different departments. <clears throat> Excuse me. It could be with sales. It could be with customer services. It could be with marketing and their communications. And this means that by interacting with different people from different departments, they're going to get, in a lot of cases, a frustrating experience. Because quite often, if they contact these different departments, they will have to explain what they're interested in, what they're interested in buying, or what their problem is, what questions they have, over and over and over again. Because most companies are working in silos. And customers are handed off as leads from marketing into sales and then into uh, maybe distribution and post-purchase and customer services. And they're handed off from one department to the other, but these departments aren't talking to each other. They're not connected. And quite often, as you can see, these interactions can be internal where we have control, but also external where it's the customer that has more control than we do. So this can create a lot of frustration. So one of the, one of the frustrations that I have about the fact that these different um, connections with the customer are siloed is that there's a lot of information being generated by all these contacts, but the information is not being integrated. So back to the, to the poll again, what would you say is the proportion of, uh, wait a minute, let me get to the right poll. What proportion of your information that you have internally 
available on your market or your customers are you using today? Is it 80 to 100 percent, 60 to 80 percent, 40 to 60 percent or less than 40? I've kept the same bands so that it was easier to work with. Um, so it's what is surprising. OK, we've got uh, 40 to 60 percent. Um, is 100% at the moment. So you're using about 60% of your data. Um, and less than, okay, 50, 50 less. So we're using 60% or less. I've got news for you. Research shows that 68% of data in a business is not being used. Think about that. The information is coming from the customer and Using that information could make their experience better, but we're not using it. I'm sure, just like me, you got frustrated when you connect with a company and you fill in your name and your email and you think, okay, I'm going to get that free book or I'm going to get that customer service call. And then I get another five questions and I fill those in, okay. Press enter and I get another five questions. So this company is collecting a lot of information about me. So shouldn't they be able to serve me better? Well, the ugly truth is, in fact, most companies are not using the information they collect. So have a think about it. What would it mean to your business if you could save 50% or more of the budget you're currently spending on gathering information? whether that's through market research, online surveys, customer service questionnaires, all the different ways you're gathering information about the market and your customers, you're wasting money if you're not using that information. And I, when I speak to clients, quite often they tell me, we might use it in the future. Sorry, that's not a good excuse. Because the more information you gather and don't use, you're in fact annoying the customer. So only gather the information you need and you're going to use. And that is a way to save money, save cus customers time, respect their time, and also stop them getting frustrated. So think about what money you could save if you didn't spend money on gathering data that you're not using. Another story for you. Normally, when I go into a client, one of the first things we look at, we do an information audit. And it's not just with the department that I'm working. I'll go around the whole organization to see what information is available. And I did this for one client, and I found that they were buying tens of copies of a very expensive industry report and nobody knew that another department had already bought that report. Now, do you think the agency selling this report told them? Of course they didn't. As a result of my identifying this and saying, buy one report and share it across the organization, I was able to save them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I told you it was a very expensive report. So information audits are a quick win for any new client because in most cases I can save them not only my initial cost, but normally tens if not hundreds times what it costs them to work with me. So. If you have processes that you are using information for, then I think that you have to consider reducing the amount of information by checking who else is already getting that information and make sure you're sharing across departments. Now, one of the most common types of surveys that companies run is a UNA, usage and awareness study. Most organizations will run some sort of study, normally annually, 
looking at how well their company and their brands are known, how they're being used, and how their share compares to that of competition. And if you're like most organization, you will run your survey and then you'll get a report and you'll get trends, right? Then what do you do? You celebrate if the numbers go up and you commiserate with each other if they go down. And then you put the report on the shelf or you file it on a folder in your PC and you never open it again. This story is about a farmer client who was doing exactly that. Every year they were doing an annual study and they were looking at the results. Now, this was a very, this client was a very particular situation. He was number three on the market in an area of um, pharma. And um, number one and two each had between 30 and 35% of the market. And they only had about 20% of the market. Therefore, they had smaller budgets, less reps visiting the doctors and hospitals than number one and two who were fighting for leadership. And so they would do their UNA study. And I said, look, what are you doing with this information? And they said, well, we look at the trends from year to year. I said, well, what, el what other information do you have on the doctors, the hospitals, your, the patients, and your products and your competitors' products? And they brought out a huge quantity of reports and information and industry reports and all sorts of sources of information that had never been looked at together, never been integrated. So I was able to do that for them to explain how to integrate the information. And we identified a new communication strategy that was in fact using webinars. Because one of the biggest frustrations that we found that doctors were complaining about was, of course, when the reps went to visit them, they always interrupted. Even when they made an appointment, you know what it's like in, in hospitals. The doctors quite often get called away to emergencies or running late, etc. So the visit of the representative of the different companies weren't really welcomed. So... As I already mentioned, my client, who was number three, didn't have as many visits to the doctors as number one and two. And therefore, they had less occasion to impact the doctor's selection of products. And of course, as a result, if they lost that, in, that opportunity to discuss with the doctor, they lost it then for months before they could make a new appointment with the doctor. By identifying that in fact doctors liked webinars because when it was on, on demand, they could watch it where and when they wanted to. So it didn't interrupt their days and they could still learn about new products and services that the companies were offering. The sales department went wild because finally they weren't the underdogs. They had something that nobody else was offering, even though the doctor said they loved webinars. But number one and two in the market were fighting with each other and copying what each other were doing. So they weren't looking for new ideas. Whereas my number three client with less budget, less reps, had to find creative ways to interact with the, ho with the hospitals and the doctors. Sales were, as I said, over the moon about it. The doctors loved it. And I can tell you that the number three is very close to being number two on the market. So how did we do all that integration of information? We used another tool from QC2 called CatSight. And this is what CatSight looks like. And if you yourself are drowning in data, because you're gathering too much and not using it, but you're thirsting for insights, then you need CatSight. Now, I spoke earlier on about insight development helping innovation, but in fact, it helps answer all sorts of questions that you might have in your market about your market itself, competitors, your brand, and your customers. 
and it saves you money, a lot of money in most cases. So let me ask you a question. Think about the last time you had a question about your business. What do you normally do? You normally run a market research project or you go and buy a report, an industry report of some sort. Have a look at the CatSite process. Gathering information is step six of the seven steps. We start by identifying the category, what the objective of the customers of that category have in buying the product or service. We identify the target customers and then we build a team from across different departments in the organization that can provide information about the category, the customer, or the objective. We then get intimate with the customer. We watch and listen to them. And finally, when we've identified gaps in the market, only then do we gather some more information. So, by using the cat site process, your market research, if you do end up running it, is more targeted, it's probably going to be faster and definitely cheaper because you're only gathering the information you need to answer the question you had at the beginning. Now, I'm sure that you've heard this phrase in your own organization or in other organizations, if only we knew what we know. I hear this in almost every client that I go into. And as I said, perhaps you say it in your own organization, but how would you feel if you did know what you already know? What difference would that make to you? What difference would it make to you if you could reduce the budget you're currently spending on gathering information and yet still know far more about the market, your brand, and your customers. A lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of frustration, and a lot of excitement because you will know your market almost certainly better than your competitors do. Now, if you completed the evaluator assessment tool, and brands or processes offered you the most development opportunities, then you need to adopt CatSight. So let's have a look um, in the chat to see if we've got any, um, any questions. Let's have a look. Um, Anne, a very, as a small family owned business where everyone is handling everything, what is so, my guerrilla tools we can use to get consumer insights. Okay, Anne, a lovely question. One of the easiest, cheapest, and quite often free ways to get information about your customers is to connect with them. Now, talk to them directly. You can also, if you have a customer care or an information um, number or email that people use to contact your, uh, your business, then have a look what they're um, asking or contacting you about. Talk to your customers. Ask them questions, but only when they've asked their questions first to you. Listening and observing customers is the best way to get to know, which is why, let me just go back to the previous process. If you notice, step five in CatSight is getting intimate with your customers. Before we do any market research, information gathering, I always ask my clients, get to know your customers. When, when I first started in marketing, uh, it was in Gillette, which is now a part of P&G, and the brand managers went out one day a week into the market. Nowadays, when I speak to um, people in marketing, they go out maybe one day a month or one day a quarter. Now, you don't have to go out of the office. If you have a website, if you have customer care, you can use those connections without even leaving your office. 
you can just listen in to the calls. You can have a look also at what's been talked about on social media. But just a word of warning, don't start interacting with customers either on the phone or on social media until you've had appropriate training. Because as I said at the beginning in Vegas, what is on the internet stays on the net. Even when you delete something, and even big companies such as Nestle have fallen, fallen foul to, um, in that case, it was actually customer services who replied badly to a consumer and said, it's my website, I can say what I like. That didn't go down well with the consumer, as you can imagine. And when Nestle saw that a customer care representative had replied like that, they deleted it from the web, but it was already too late because other people had taken screenshots and they could also go into a previous version of the chat and find it back. So be very careful. Please don't interact directly with your customers yourself listen to people that had the appropriate training and see how they interact. And if you would like to interact, then ask them for help before you actually get loose, let loose on, on customer care phones or um, internet or chat lines. But it's a great source. And thank you, Anne, for the question. I hope I've answered and given you some ideas. Um, you talked about guerrilla tools. Um, I would call these just tools that everybody should be using. Um, and hopefully I've given you all some ideas about uh, how you can connect with your customers. So with that said, let's get on to the final area, which is multidimensional. So um, by the way, if you've still got questions, please add them into the chat and we can go through them at the end. If I don't have time to answer them all, then I will um, make sure that I get back to you within 24 hours with a personal answer. So let's look at the multidimensional aspect. I've already talked about the problem in a lot of organizations is that they're working in silos. And um, in fact, everybody should be involved in delighting the customer. And you might think, well, it's only marketing or sales or customer services that have direct access. But think about it. Finance, they could have problems with pricing or invoicing or after sales service that they have contact with the customer. IT, well, they have websites, they have the chat and text messages. They have digital connections that, again, consumers might have um, problems with and they would get in contact with the IT department. Marketing, obviously, communications and innovation. Sales, products and service descriptions and fulfillment. Management, well, they're providing a top-down role model, or they should. Operations, um, understanding what customers only dream of having. And HR, making sure that they only employ empathetic employees that are passionate about pleasing the customer. So many departments, and they all within one company, but quite often are siloed, as we've already seen. And it's the job of the CEO to create a mission and vision that brings them all together. So I want to um, see about uh, how CEOs can drive that um, customer-centric spirit within organizations. Here are some mission statements from four companies, and I just pulled out various industries, and um, you can see that they're not very inspiring. There's little, if any, mention of the customer. Wells Fargo does mention the customer, but they mention finance twice as often as the customer. And to be honest, it could be for any bank or financial institution, couldn't it? It's not specific to Wells Fargo. Uber's mission is very corporate. Canon and their Kiyose, uh, they only talk about products. 
and and McDonald's is very general. So here are some mission statements that are far more inspiring. They are um, mission statements that would get employees excited. I mean, who wouldn't like to wow its customers as Zappos does and be more customer centric as Amazon is? It's no wonder that Amazon ended up buying Zappos because they're on exactly the same understanding of being customer centric. Or how about Ikea that wants to serve as many people as possible with affordable products and Southwest who want to give the highest customer service. So pull out your own mission statement uh, if you remember to bring it or if you didn't have a look at it afterwards. Does it speak about the customer or does it speak about products? Your place like Ikea did or the price? Um, is it inspiring? Would it motivate your employees to delight your customers? Would you feel proud to work in an organization that had that mission statement? If not, then perhaps it's time for an update. And why it's so important, the mission statement is something that every employee should be reading every day and working towards that mission that has been set for the organization. And unfortunately, employees' willingness to support businesses has gone down in recent years. They just don't feel as involved as they used to. But when you have a mission statement that excites and inspires employees, employees feel more supportive and proud of the organization that they're working in. And in fact, 70% of employees are more likely to support the company, be proud, talk about their company. And the way to do this is not by making these huge, big transformations. That's why the uh, willingness to support enterprise changes has gone down because changes tend to be far too big. By making small, we like to say atomic, to remind us of QC2, by making small changes, employees feel involved, there's less resistance, and they're more likely to be supportive of your mission, and therefore they're more likely to stay in the company for longer, to be loyal and also to become high performers because they feel implicated by the mission and by what the company is trying to do. So think about how much you would gain from having happier employees that are more loyal and feel proud to work for a company that is answering customer needs by having a mission statement that talks about delighting the customer, serving the customer, and not like Canon did about having products and, and um, innovation and things like that. Yes, it's important, but innovation to satisfy the customer, not innovation for innovation's sake, as we, we saw earlier on. So um, let's just take one final break. I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, okay, so Frank, you've dropped out. That's okay. Um, I um, don't know if we have any more questions. Nobody has added any in. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, feel free to um, add them in to the, uh, to the chat. And uh, let's go on to the summary. And um, just review what we covered. We talked about the four key elements of customer experience and how to identify your new priorities to delight your customers, how to discover how to be in that 5% of innovations that succeed, how to reduce your resources, both time, money, and people, 
by only gathering the information you need by using the cat site process of identification, running an audit of the information you have before you go and gather more information. And sorry, and also inspiring employees to go above and beyond the call of duty, like we, we like to say. So I'm going to have one more poll, which is how you're feeling about um, Okay, I can't seem to get the poll. Oh, here we are. This is the last one is um, how you're feeling now, whether you're excited or um, scared now. Um, hopefully you're excited. Great, that's good to see. 100% of people that have voted are excited. So that's great. I'm really happy. Um, if you'd like, I've only covered three areas of quantum customer centricity, the QC2 model. Um, if you'd like to learn more, then feel free to um, book time on my agenda. And I'm going to just put up a link so that you can... Click on that link and you'll go to my private agenda where you can book some time. Um, we can talk about some of the areas we've already talked about, how to save up to 65% of your information investments, how to move from renovation to innovation and be amongst the 5% of innovations that succeed, how to build a culture where employees are more motivated and inspired, but we can also look at other areas such as preparing your organization to be prepared for all future opportunities and risks that might come in the coming months or years and how to improve your customer's experience so they'll pay even more for what you're already offering. So if you're interested, click some time, uh, click the link and you'll go to my agenda and you can uh, book some time. And when you do book, I will give you access for free to the full evaluator. It's an assessment tool that will assess your business on the four areas that we've talked about today. And that way we can make full use of the time together, talking about your development opportunities based upon your personal data. And I will also be able to then compare you to other in companies within your industry to see if you're ahead or behind um your competitors so that's a really useful additional value that you will get to booking the the call you will get access for free to the full evaluator not just the mini one that you filled in before you came here so um please add in to the chat if you've any more questions let me just check um they don't seem to be at the moment if you are interested in um in a call book time with me or go on to C3 Centricity's website and you can uh, click on the contact link and book some time with me directly there. Or of course you can drop me an email. And um, congratulations, we went 10 minutes over the hour, um, but there's just so much I could share with you about this new model. And um, I hope you're as excited as I am to look at your CX model, get customers more excited, get your employees more excited, get you more excited in not only satisfying, but delighting your customers, improving their experience so you can develop more successful innovations and you can even raise your prices was reducing your budget for information. So a lot, I hope you've got a lot of value out of this uh, call today, this executive briefing. I'm not planning on running another one. I only planned on running one, but I had so many people ask, and a lot of you I'm sure are here, that you um, wanted to join a live session with me. And that's why I ran this second session. So thank you for joining. And um, again, please feel free to 
add questions, reach out to me, C3 Centricity Contact, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for joining. Bye for now.